Hey guys, it is May 9th. We're your hosts, Doc J and JD. And you are listening or watching on YouTube, the Full Court Press Podcast. Let's run it. Hey guys, welcome to the Full Core Press Podcast. Um, before we start, thanks so much for dropping by. If you have time, please like and subscribe for the channel. It helps us grow. Um, our Donovan Mitchell video has really blown, blown up and we want to thank you guys so much for all the love you're showing us. Um, we have our 42 subscribers now, which is fantastic. Um, keep that rolling for us, guys. We love the fact that you guys are commenting, positive or negative. We know it's because you guys are passionate about basketball the same way we are. So thank you so much. Like and subscribe. And uh, JD, I'm excited about today's podcast, man. I'm super excited. It's something that I've wanted to talk to or talk about for a while. And now we finally get a chance to do so. And I think that it's going to be a lot of fun. Absolutely. So I know today we are going to kind of discuss our favorite team, Utah Jazz, <laughs> and talk about um, their off season and what moves we think would be beneficial for them to make um, in terms of trying to compete for a title in the next few years, maybe three to five years down the line. Yep, exactly. And just to get us started, Got a little slideshow for everybody to take a look at here for the load. Okay. Yeah, I think it'll be a lot of fun. We're going to be talking about this Utah Jazz offseason. First and foremost, we wanted to really talk about the 2023 draft as the Utah Jazz are going to be taking the number nine pick, which was their own, the number 16 pick which will be taken from the Minnesota Timberwolves, which we acquired from that Rudy Gobert trade, and the number 28th pick from the Philadelphia 76ers, which we acquired from the Royce O'Neal pick. Then we're going to be diving into the free agency, you know, looking at the Utah Jazz cap space, or notable free agents, maybe that the Jazz could go after, maybe some potential trades they could do that year, versus you know the unrestricted and restricted free agents that they could take a look at right something else i would also like to uh remind everyone you know we are projected at nine but there is always the possibility the jazz could move up now we do have a 4.5 percent chance to be in the top four and i think like a one percent chance to get the number one pick but it does happen in 1993 it happened to the orlando magic actually they had a 1% chance to get the number one pick, and they got the number one pick. So I'm just throwing it out there. It does happen, probably unlikely, mm -hmm. but you know, there's always that possibility. But like you said, let's look at the guys who are going to be around um, projected at nine. Yeah. And uh, just to kind of start us off, I have Kaysen Wallace here at number nine. And something, you know, a little intriguing before we go in and just kind of a caveat like you were mentioning i i know that the jazz have the ninth the 16th and the 28th pick but i would not be surprised if the jazz end up trading some of those or trying to trade up in the draft or maybe if somebody even slips you know from what you have projected as the top five six or seven guys you know mm -hmm. they might go for somebody who has you know the most athletic ability there's a lot to consider however tony jones from the athletic uh, a staple here in Utah has mentioned that they're looking for lengthy guards and that's probably who they're going to go after maybe with the ninth pick and the 16th pick vice versa or a power forward you know those are the two gaps that I think the Jazz are trying to make uh, alongside their pieces with Walker Kessler and Lowry Markkinen so with Case and Wallace for instance um you you look at his stats I don't necessarily think they jump right out uh right out of the bow or you think that you know they're the most incredible eye popping thing you've ever seen mm -hmm. but uh, i think this guy shows a lot of talent i think he's known for his versatile defense and granted i think that his 
field goal percentage and his three point percentage are pretty great. Uh, below yeah. this, you see his free throw percentage, you know, might might need a little work, but I think that's going to be fixed in the NBA. He'll probably be shooting, you know, somewhere around the 80s as he's, you know, progressing and growing. And I think this is a guy that a lot of people say that, you know, he might not have the hugest uh, ceiling as a player, mm -hmm. but I think he can come right out the gate and be a good guy. And I personally think he does have, you know, quite a ceiling. I think that this guy reminds me of a Jeru Holiday, could be a multiple all-star player throughout his mm -hmm. career and he's probably going to be a starter throughout the career what do you think doc yeah i think kentucky is a fantastic basketball program and i think case and wallace showed a lot of versatility not just on offense but on defense as well actually one of my favorite games that he played was a game where he was not effective whatsoever um on uh with, with scoring i think he missed almost all of his shots he only had like two or four points but what stood out to me was he had 11 assists that game. Um, and so when I'm looking at players and I'm trying to project um, their potential, something I always look at is, okay, well, how can this, this player affect the game? Is he affecting the game in more ways than one? Um, and Kaysen showed that he can absolutely do that. He was not doing well scoring that game. And he was like, you know what? I can still move and facilitate ball movement. That to me is the hallmark of a multi-time all-star guy, you know? And I absolutely think that his versatility on defense is going to be um, best suited for really any NBA team. I think that I would love to have him. Like you said, the stats don't really pop off the page you know he's not like getting your 20 and, and nine or anything crazy like that but solid percentages uh six four 185 pounds very versatile defender um and look when we when we're drawing comparisons to drew holiday i think it's important to also remember the bucks picked up drew holiday and then they won the title so Defense matters. It's not always the sexiest thing, but it matters. Marcus Smart definitely like locks it down for mm -hmm. the Boston Celtics. You know, I think he could absolutely be like a Marcus Smart kind of guy as well. Um, I don't know if he'd ever be Defensive Player of the Year. Um, I, in fact, I think Marcus Smart was the first guard to win that since um, Gary Payton. If I'm not mistaken, it's been decades. However, full circle. Uh, Kaysen Wallace is going to be a guy who's going to progress. I would absolutely love to have someone like that on the Jazz. Yeah. Yeah, I think I would too. I think that he's probably one of the more likely guys that the Jazz are going to take. I mean, with Danny Ainge, he did select Marcus Smart. He loved him. I think mm -hmm. this guy has a similar fit, you know, and like you're mentioning about defensive teams, a lot of times the guys that win the chips are top 10 offense and defense. So yes. it's definitely something to consider. Yes. You need to play defense if you're going to win titles. Yep. Well, another guy that maybe the, the Utah Jazz would be considering would be Grady Dick. Now, this guy I, I've been kind of high on since the start of the college season. Um, he has definitely shown a lot of promise. He has really great stats. One of the best uh, off the dribble three shooters in the class. He's probably maybe the best, if not the second best shooter in this draft class and he's six eight maybe a bit slimmer of a build but he's a guy who can really shoot very mm -hmm. versatile cutter he's a very smart player he's actually in the upper percentile when it comes to pick and roll so he knows how to pass the ball and uh he was on kansas who was one of the best teams in the uh, in college basketball and mm -hmm. something interesting that i really liked about him doc is that this guy wasn't necessarily the primary ball handler. You know, he'd be coming off screens, he'd be cutting. He didn't right. need the ball to score. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that he has very solid fundamentals. Um, and I think that Grady Dick is one of those players that, you know, he doesn't come off as like the sexiest draft pick, but he's going to get the job done. He reminds me a lot of like JJ Redick, Bojan Bogdanovich, mm -hmm. um, Seth Curry, not Steph, Seth Curry, these guys who were, well, Seth Curry is really not that big, um, but guys who were prototypical three and D big men 
who are able to shoot. Maybe like a Kevin Herter. Yes, yes, just like Kevin Herter, um, where you can put him at the two, you put him at the three if you want to. He has the size and versatility to really play off the ball well. Guys like that um, always go. They're like hotcakes, man. Everyone in the NBA needs a guy like that. I would not be surprised if he got selected earlier than nine, to be honest. Really? Because he's not, like I said, he's not the sexiest, you know, draft pick. But when you look at what he can bring, he's an NBA ready talent. He just is. Like his fundamentals are insanely solid. And mm-hmm. and I agree with you. I think that statistically he was in the top one or two. I think he's in I think he's actually the best shooter in this draft class in terms of off the ball. Mm-hmm. Um dude was a beast. So personally, I don't know if I would pick him if I was the Jazz. Um, I would be aiming more for kind of like what Tony Jones said of, per the athletic and you know, you and I love the athletic. They're very reputable in their sports journalism. I'd be shooting for uh, Taylor Hendricks, man. Definitely. Just so happens that we're going to be talking about Taylor Hendricks. Ooh. And uh, Taylor Hendricks, I think this is a guy, you know, if you if you compare Kaysen Wallace and Grady Dick, I think those two, they're pretty structural players. I think those two are guys who will undoubtedly be pretty good in the nba but i think of the three that we've talked about at least leading into taylor Hendricks, i think this guy has the most upside now if you take a look at those percentages i think those are eye popping and this was this guy was quite the riser in the draft um just especially over march madness he was shooting well he was playing well leading his team and uh something that i really like about him is that this guy can also, you know, shoot out of the gym. He's a, he's a great defender. He's a great shooter. As you can see, he was shooting something close to around 50, 40, 80, which is mm-hmm. incredible for somebody of his size. I think he's sitting yeah. around 6'9", 6'10". And uh, I think he has the similar yeah. weight of Jason Tatum, who when he was coming into the draft. 6'9", so, you know, 2'10". Yep. So this guy will bulk up. He's going to be, uh, I think, a dominant force. And the fact that he can really shoot outside, he's going to be able to spread the floor. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, the Jazz are looking for a guard. They're also looking for a power forward to lead the franchise. I think uh, you could definitely take a shot on this guy. And I think yeah. that he could really pan out. I think that the most glaring issue looking at the new Jazz team that was put together was even though they have all this size, there were teams that were just beating them off the glass, you know? And that can't be the case. You need to have someone who can get you rebounds. It can't just be Walker Kessler or Lowry Marketing. Um, I think that they had a glaring hole at power forward that they tried to fill with Kenny Olynyk. And while I love KO, um, he is not going to be the starting four of the future. I think Taylor Hendricks is that guy. I would absolutely snag him up 100%. Like you said, he has the size, he has the athleticism, he can spread the floor, he's a dog on defense, he's going to get you those buckets, he's going to get you those rebounds. He put up a great stat line in college. That is, and like, that is the fun of this draft class, man. There are so many guys, you know that are just have they're oozing with potential you know i know that mm-hmm. some people say analytically that oh this is a terrible draft class blah 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 you know what analytics they're great but they make you lazy you can't mark or or gauge potential with analytics that's just how it is and i think taylor Hendricks, if i was a jazz absolutely especially because you know at, at 16 to um their next draft pick there's still a bunch of guys who are are going to be good two-way combo guards that you can use yep i couldn't agree more i think with hendrix too a fun lineup would be having you know colin sexton at point guard mm-hmm. uh, ochaya baji you got uh taylor hendrix at the power forward lowry markinen and walker kessler i think that's oh going to be a God. good defensive team it'd be yeah. a lot of fun to watch that's a that's a lockdown defensive team who can get the rebound as well. Like that is oof. 
And Doc, I think you give that team a few years, like maybe one more year to develop further. They're going to be a top 10 defensive team. I absolutely agree with you. I think Walker Kessler, by the way, who was selected first team all rookie. Congratulations to, I guess, the sheriff. If that if that's what we're calling him now. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we love you, Walker. Good job, man. I can't wait to see this this kid continue to develop because he's going to be something amazing. I know he is. He is going to be, and I'm. This isn't a hot take. This is going to be fact one day. That guy is going to be a multi-time DPOY. Wow. I absolutely believe that. I think he could he be. Is be better than Rudy Gobert. He's already offensively more capable, and I think that he has the lateral movement defensively to be one of the greatest defenders the, the league's ever seen. I really well, think I think if you had to take one of the two, especially given the contract that Rudy has, I think mm -hmm. every NBA team's probably taken Kessler. I mean, kid's a beast. For sure. Who's Final guy we... Final guy we wanted to talk about that uh, might, I think this guy's probably going to go six to eight in the draft, probably. but he could slip into nine. Anthony Black, he is a six, seven point guard who has a really good feel for the game. Mm -hmm. um, he's sitting around, you know, four assists, but I think that those numbers might be skewed once they go into the NBA where the floor can be spread a little bit better. I think this guy's a really good passer. I thought he shot well. Uh, the three point percentage is Maybe something to be desired, but uh, he reminds me a lot of a guy from OKC. Do you happen to know who that guy is, Doc? Are we talking about Josh Giddy? Josh Giddy. The Australian, man. That kid is sensational. Um, and I agree. I think that there is a lot of Josh Giddy comparison with Anthony Black. Um, and something I really like about Black, too, man. The, kid, the kid's a dog, dude. Like, I was listening to one of his, his interviews initially of why he chose Arkansas, and he was just like, I just want to be in the NBA. I want to play basketball. I love kids with that mindset. And then when Nick Smith Jr. got hurt, he just took over all of the ball handling responsibility for Arkansas. And he did not disappoint. Um, if I'm not mistaken, too, he played more minutes than any other college kid in the nation. He, he was averaging, I think, close to 33, 34 minutes. Okay. Like that kid, he's going to be able to come start playing right away. He has a lot of things he's going to have to fix, you know, but you can work on shooting mechanics. You can't work on heart. You can't work on athleticism. Well, you can, but you want to have those things in place fundamentally. The fact that he's six seven, dude, he's massive for a point guard. Massive. He can defend the one, two, three, no problem. Like, oof. I've always been a fan of Anthony Black. Yeah, me as well. Um, I would like to have him. I think of uh the guys that we've talked about, he might be number one on my list, although I do like Casey Wallace as well. Yeah, I I do as well. But I'm I'm gonna tell you this, with that ninth pick. I'd be selecting uh, Hendricks, absolutely. Over the other guys? Oh yeah, because I think that there's, this is such a, a, a very potent guard class as well, that you have great picks at 16. Yeah, that's a good point. And uh, just moving on to 16, there's a lot of variants that could be had. People might be able to slide, but uh, here are some of the guys that I think the Utah Jazz might go after. Mm -hmm. And granted, uh, just to reiterate, the Jazz are probably wanting to go after a guard as well as a power forward. So these right. guys both fit that bill. Well, these, yeah, these guys fit that bill. And, uh, you know, looking at a few of them, uh, a few of them stick out to me. What do you think, Doc? Um, see, this is exactly what I was talking about. When you have guys like Jalen hood Shafino, Jet Howard... Um, Buffkin is a he's a big guard too, isn't he? He's six four. He's yeah. a little slim, but I think he could put on weight. Yeah, see, those are three very impressive selections right there. I think Gigi Jackson um, has the potential to become something truly transcendent. The only problem is he's going to take a while to develop. That's just yep. the truth. He's not going to be a guy who comes into the NBA. <laughs> at least in my opinion, who knows, you know, he's not going to come in here and just start averaging 20 points per game. I would not be surprised if 
he had like a Lowry Markkinen effect where、mm-hmm. we don't really see how good he becomes till he's like five, six years in the league. And then all of a sudden, he has like a breakout year. I could totally see Gigi doing that. Well, something a lot of people don't know about Gigi is that he was the youngest guy in college for、mm-hmm. the NCAA basketball. And、yeah. something even more interesting about him is he's two months, I believe, younger than LeBron James's boy. <laughs> so crazy. Yeah. So he should have he should have been going in the next year's draft, where a lot of people would say he'd be going number one. And you know, just looking at his highlights, you can tell that this guy has really good ball handling skills. His stats、mm-hmm. this year weren't the best, but he could really develop. Has a huge upside. <laughs> Yeah, I think so too. I think that, but caveat to that, I really think that it's going to take him a few years to to develop. I, do I don't.、Too. I think he's very far outside the Jazz's window. Could be, could be, and、uh, some other guys, you know, like talking about Jalen Hood, Shafino. He、uh, he has a really good mid range. This guy's also something like six six, maybe close to six seven. So he's a、mm-hmm. big guard. He has a really good feel out of the pick and roll, good passer like that.、Um, some people might be skeptical of him. He didn't have the best shooting, you know, best decision making. But I like him. I think my favorite of all of these guys would be Kobe Bufkin. I think he was in the one or two best transition players as well as finishing players in college basketball. And this、yeah. is his sophomore year, granted, but you know, there's a lot of great sophomores that come out in the draft and really. Really、uh, make an impact and do well, and I think he really can and could be a star in the league in the future. Yeah, definitely. I mean, he definitely is going to be a starter minimum. You know, I mean, look at Obaji. Obaji was a senior when he got selected,、um, mm-hmm. but I think that he's going to be a, a starting player in the league for the next ten years.、Um, age, you know, like there, there's a huge drop off athletically. In terms of when you hit your 30s, for a lot of players, and and age just comes quickly. That's why all these teams always try to draft so young so they can develop the, the guys on their program. But when you're taking a guy at 22, you're still going to get 10, 12, 13 really good years out of them.、Mm-hmm. So, and I think guys like Jalen Hood, Shafino, Kobe Bufkin, you know, like I I would, and Jet Howard too. I mean, Jet Howard would almost be like a no brainer for me if he's available. Yeah, he's a you know he's a power forward. He could shoot the lights out, and so we'll have to see what the Utah Jazz take. You know, at number sixteen, and it's、sure、definitely going to vary. Are you sure he's a power forward? I thought he was a guard. He's just a massive guard, isn't he? Um, I mean, I guess he could be a guard. I thought he was a power forward due to his size, but yeah, he's yeah, huge. Right. He's six, six eight. It's six、insane. eight. Pretty heavy too. But yeah, maybe he is a guard. We'll have to look、I、at that. All right, let me let me just check that really quick. Okay. okay, so on Tankathon. By the way, guys, we love we love Tankathon. dot com. It's a fantastic website for simulating mock drafts、uh, and really helping you look at statistics and analytics for players. I'd recommend it for anyone who nerds over this stuff the same way JD and I do.、Um, they have him as a shooting guard, a six eight shooting guard. Okay, you were right. That that is huge. huge. But oh、so、my god, that、gosh. might be somebody. But、uh, you know, moving on. Mm-hmm. I think we wanted to start talking about、uh, who could take, who we could take at twenty-eight. And granted, I think the Jazz actually might not keep this pick. However, I do like a lot of the guys in the twenties. I think、mm-hmm. that it's interesting to look at this draft class because a lot of the guys, you know, early on in the lottery, maybe even a little outside of the lottery, they don't have the best stats. But、uh, a lot of these guys, these analysts. They look at them and they see a lot of potential in them. You know, maybe somebody like Amin Thompson, for example,、yeah. not the best shooter. I think he was shooting in the low twenties, three point, and then mid thirties for field goal percentage. Not the best at all. In fact, if you looked at his stats just on paper, you might think, "Is this guy even going into the NBA?" But there's more to it. You know, you have to look at his、uh, his upside. You have to watch his film, and he has an incredible first step. Very quick,、mm-hmm. very athletic. There's a lot of guys like that, but in the 20s, you know, there's people like Julian Strother, who's a junior.、Um, he went to Gonzaga. He was shooting pretty well. He seems like a decent player. There's somebody like Sidi Sissoko. He was a freshman with the G League Ignite, 
Um, we've talked a little bit about him before. I like him personally. I would love to get him. I think he's going to go a little bit higher than 28. But uh, I think the moment that there's something, you know, like the combine, there's workouts, there's, this might be flipped upside down, Doc. A lot of these guys might go much higher. You know, maybe the guys that we thought were really high might go much lower. So it's really interesting to think about. It is. And guys, um, just a reminder too, uh, JD and I will be covering the combine. We're going to be covering the NBA draft lottery as well. Um, and then when the draft actually occurs. So make sure you guys tune in with us for that. You know, it's interesting. The Utah Jazz have always notoriously been able to build teams um, with with either late lottery picks or like really high first round picks. You know, Carmelo was 13. I think Stockton was 12. Donovan Mitchell was was 14 or 13. Rudy Gobert was 27. Um, you know, like the Jazz, Andre Karolinko too, he was 22. And Walker Kessler he was also, I think he was 24, something like that. But I would not be surprised if the Jazz did keep this pick because historically they are so good at building through the draft. And when you have a mastermind like Danny Ainge, who's on board now and helping you develop this team, I think that the Jazz wanted to get all these draft picks so they could take all these bites of the apple. And I, I would not be shocked if they found themselves like a really good role player at 28. I mean, when you find Rudy Gobert, who was a project at 27, um, you know, like there, there are guys out there, the Jazz knows how, the Jazz is an organization that's very good with developing their guys. They're oh, yeah. not afraid to, um, build through the draft they always have you know and i could see them getting one of these guys and turning them into like like city city could be coming off the bench as, as our number one you know he, he could be leading the, the the bench for us at some point in time um i think guys like um, leonard miller as well he's a power forward he plays in the g league uh, he played on the same team as Scoot Henderson, G League Ignite, same with City. Like, it's interesting because, like, Scoot Henderson is such a focal point because he's going to go at number two, like, maybe number three if something crazy happens. But you don't actually look sometimes at the other guys on the team who played fantastically. Leonard and City both stepped up when Scoot shut it down during the year, you know? Like Leonard Miller knows how to play basketball. City knows how to play basketball. And if those guys are up in the 20s, snap them, take them. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And something interesting that you're saying too, Doc, is that uh, I think the Utah Jazz have a really, really good program to develop people. Yes. So I think that most likely two out of these three guys are going to pan out. And oh, yeah. I think whoever we're really taking, we could probably develop them into something great. I totally agree. And you know what? Development too is such a overlooked piece of a franchise. I mean, a perfect example of why it's so vital too, before we, we continue on, is look what's happening to Golden State right now. They're now down 3-1. Um, they had to pull Jordan Poole off the floor that next generation of, of guys that we're supposed to develop have not been able to develop because they can't get any playing time. Um, and Steve Kerr even came out during the year and said, this isn't the best place to develop young talent. I mean, they sent off their, uh, what was it? The number three pick or two pick James Wiseman, mm -hmm. you know, to Detroit. The moment he got over there, he started averaging like 17 and 10 or something like that but like golden state has a fantastic championship pedigree i'm not saying that they're not like an incredible franchise but you have to develop your young players you have to invest the time into developing those guys or else you, look look how top heavy golden state is right now outside of you know clay draymond wiggins and curry they don't have anything when curry leaves the floor they have one of the biggest plus minuses like in the NBA. So yeah, I agree. You got to find guys, you got to develop them. And luckily the Utah Jazz, they're fantastic at that. Yeah. Hopefully those guys will pan out. And, uh, you know, moving on to our next stage of talking about this 
off season, a deep dive on it is uh, with the Utah Jazz and their free agency. Uh, something can, to consider is their cap space. Mm-hmm. And this next year, this uh, next NBA season, we're going to have roughly 30 to 55 mil in cap space. Some notable guys who have player options are Taylor Horton Tucker, Jordan Clarkson. I think Jordan Clarkson's around 14 mil. THT is around 10 mil. Maybe with the player option, he's getting something around 11. Damian Jones has a player option. And let's see who, if Rudy Gay. Now, I think Rudy Gay and uh, Damian Jones are for sure going to use their player option, stay with the Jazz. What do you think about THT and Clarkson, Doc? I don't think that they're – sorry, I was trying to look up different teams with projected cap space as well. Um, I don't think there's any way Clarkson picks up that player option. For $14 million, no way. There are tons of teams out there that can offer him way more than that, and he's going to get way more than that. He had a career year this year. Mm-hmm. Um, and even if you're the Lakers, you you might want to pursue someone like Jordan Clarkson. You know, like if I was Rob Palenka, I would be letting D'Lo walk, and I would be putting all, all pushing all my chips in the middle of the table for a guy like Jordan Clarkson. Absolutely. Yeah. You know? Thought. Um, so wherever I, I don't think he's going to take that 14 million option. I think he signed a very team friendly deal yeah. because at that time he wanted to win. He does want to win. He's a competitor and he knows that the Utah Jazz's window to compete for a championship is over and restarting. And I don't blame him for wanting to go somewhere and continue to compete and win. It's why all of these guys play basketball because they want to win. They are competitive because they're athletes. That's what makes the sport fun. And Jordan Clarkson has been nothing but a professional here in Utah. He know, He's a cult and fan favorite. We love him. And I really, I kind of worry because sometimes Utah Jazz fans can be notoriously over emotional about things. Like uh, Gordon, the whole Gordon Hayward situation is, is a, a great example. Like why, why are we still hating on Gordon Hayward? How long ago was that? That was like six years ago. Like, are we really going to boo this man every single time he comes here? It's it's ridiculous. <laughs> like stuff like that. Just I worry about that because Jordan Clarkson, if he walks away, which he should to get more money and go compete somewhere. I just want him to know that he's always going to be loved here in Utah. Same with Donovan Mitchell. Same with Rudy Gobert. Like, look. He should absolutely go somewhere and get a bag, you know? Why not? And I think he will. Uh, I think he does like being here in Utah. He's mentioned that before. And the mm-hmm. Jazz might give him an offer, you know, upwards of 18 to 20 million, which I think is probably where he's going to sit out with another team. But somebody right. might, you know, extend him a little bit more than that. And at that point, I don't think the Jazz will try and keep him. Yeah, I mean, even if the Jazz do offer him something like that, like our championship window is not open right now Mm -hmm. at all and one of the reasons he extended here was to try to win a title so i could see even if the jazz offer him something like that i don't think clarkson comes back whatsoever it's not a personal choice it's a business decision but the man wants to go somewhere he wants to get paid and he wants to win a title i could see teams like miami going for him um the knicks could possibly take a swing at him i think i think the lakers 100 percent are going to try to get clarkson um and you know the jazz could try to retain him but at the end of the day like if you're a basketball player of jordan clarkson's caliber and you signed a team friendly deal because you were competing for a title and that title window closed would you stay me if i'm him i wouldn't and well, it's not personal Doc, something to consider, too, is that Danny Ainge, is he's really mentioned, you know, at the start of the year that he's hoping with this rebuild by year three that we would be a contender. We're making the playoffs, you know, progressing. So there is a chance that the Utah Jazz might be all in. And, uh, you know, something to consider as well with our cap space is Lowry Markinen. And uh, he's on some interesting... Uh, He's on an interesting deal right now. Do you want to talk about that a little bit, Doc? 
Yeah, so Lowry Marketing, um, his his last guaranteed year is actually going to be next year, where he's going to make 17 million, and then his 2024 into 2025 is only guaranteed up to six million. I think it would be a very very um, good gesture from the Utah Jazz to fully guarantee that last year as soon as possible. Now, the deadline for that is going to be June 1st of 2024. So that'll be next year's draft. Um, but I would just, I would guarantee it. Absolutely. You know, like, look what he has done this year for us. You know, like, unless you were watching FIBA, which we both were, you know, how would you have projected that he was going to be this kind of player? Which we did, by the way. <laughs> um, you know, like he he was, uh, what is it, most improved player of the year, mm -hmm. which he absolutely deserved because he went from 14 points to 25. He had an incredibly efficient stat line. He was one of the most efficient players in the NBA. In fact, there was one point where he was the most efficient player in the NBA, averaging 20 or more points off of 50, 40, and 90. And he was alongside Steph Curry and Kevin Durant. Mm -hmm. which is and incredible. Donovan Mitchell. And then there was a point where he overtook all of them in terms of efficiency. So I would absolutely guarantee that last year, and then I would, however the, the CBA works, I would offer this man excuse me the the max the max i could mm -hmm. for the next five years because so, i think that he's a foundational piece i think that um you know when you look at his fiba stat line he put up 28 points nine nine boards off the same kind of efficiency you know and then the last 50 games the last 50 games of this last season he averaged 28 and nine you know, mm -hmm. over the entire season, yeah, he averaged 25. You know, he started at 22, but it continued to rise. And when you can average 28 over 50 games, I'm sorry, like, there's no way he doesn't come out next year and do the same thing. He's going to get 28 and 10. And uh, I think that's just going to be who the new Lowry Markinen is. Yeah, you know, I think it's something to really think about. I think that he had a great time with FIBA at uh, boomed his confidence oh, and yeah. the Utah Jazz gave him an opportunity to be that player you know uh, mold the team around him and he really showed that he could continue that process I think there was even development this year you know he wasn't just like incredible right out the gate well he was in a way but uh, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, there was still further development with him mm -hmm. he was able to continue uh, from what he was doing with FIBA but you know progress further be a primary ball handler in certain situations be the go-to guy when we were needing him in clutch factors and uh you know something i love about lowry and you know what you were kind of mentioning too is i think this guy's ceiling has not been uh well it hasn't been sealed yet he hasn't gotten there yet oh, i yeah. think that next year he's gonna do better uh you think 28 i'm thinking maybe more 26 27 points per game which is incredible he's gonna be an all-star i believe again oh, yeah. i think that's what's next for him i think that he's gonna continue developing um a lot of people are thinking okay is this guy a number one option on a championship team or a number two i think that the way that he's developing right now you you pair him up with you know a guy who's incredible too a second option he mm -hmm. could be the number one option I agree. I agree 100%. A lot of people wonder if he is a number one option. I think he is, without a doubt. Look, 28 and 10. I'm putting it out there right now, guys. I'm telling you, this kid is going to come out. He's getting 28 and 10 next year. I would I'd bet my, my mortgage on it. Because <laughs> he, he did it in FIBA, and then he did it the last 50 games of an 82-game season. That is not some small sample size. Like, that is who he's going to be. You know, I absolutely think that he is a number one option. I think he's going to get better and better. I think the thing he really needs to focus on working on is going to be those isolation plays yep. because he's not very good in isolation. 
Mm-hmm. Um, he often has his uh, pocket picked, you know, the ball mm-hmm. stolen when he's trying yep. to drive and swerve and stuff like that. But he is transcendent. He is an all NBA talent. Um, he should be all NBA this year over Anthony Davis, in my opinion. And that is not just because I'm a jazz fan. That's just the facts. Um, I don't even think Anthony Davis should be in the running for all NBA because he missed so many freaking games. But look, mm-hmm. this dude is that kind of player. He is the real deal. And um, we just need to find a second piece to get alongside of him. You know, that's what they're going to try and do. And uh, like I was mentioning before, I think Danny Ainge might want to go in, go all in maybe this next year or the year after, try and get a pivotal piece for the Jazz. However, I don't think it's too likely, but it's, you know, it's something to look at. There's a few guys this offseason that maybe, you know, they're they're hitting the pinnacle of their career. They're very expensive with the cap space that the Jazz have. They could take a swing on some of these guys. Uh, you know, with Chris Middleton, for example, I don't think that this guy is necessarily going to leave the Bucks. However, no uh, if he did, you'd probably have to pay him around, you know, what he's making now, maybe slightly more. I think he's around 31, 32 years old. He's a good player. You could pair him alongside Markkanen. Uh, I think of these guys that we have listed, I would probably want to go for Dennis Schroeder. I think that he has great experience in the playoffs. He is not extremely expensive. Um, And granted, these guys are more, you know, within a a three-year window. Somebody that you would want to have, you know, to give you the experience you need to go all in maybe and try and win a chip within the next three years. And that's kind of what Danny Ainge was saying he might want to do. However, I don't think the Jazz are really going to target any of these guys. Uh, Something else to consider as well. Those are the people I want to see. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, these guys are not on the free agency list, but with the draft capital that the Utah Jazz have, they might consider going for a trade. You know, and, and... Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, JD. Guys, I just want our listeners to to understand this right here is we are just speculating what could be possible. None of these guys are on the table. To our knowledge, none of them have said that they want to leave their franchises. However, we understand that the NBA is a business. And if you call up Portland and you offer them an insane package for Damian Lillard, You can't tell me reasonably that they're not going to look at that and think, oh, man, maybe we do want four Mm -hmm. or five draft picks and then a slew of young players, you know? So once again, those are not rumors. We are just speculating what we think could occur. Well, Doc, I kind of want to dive into this speculation because can the Utah Jazz really catch an NBA team on a rebuild? or Mm -hmm. maybe an NBA team that wants to switch things up. You know, looking at these guys, for instance, you know, someone like Damian Lillard, he has expressed that he doesn't necessarily want to be rebuilding again. I'm sure the guy is wanting to win. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Portland Trailblazers are looking to move on from him. You know, they've got Shaden Sharp. They've got Anthony Simons. You know, they've Mm -hmm. got guys that they can maybe rebuild. And, you know, I think Damian likes being in Portland. He probably wants to stay. And these are just speculative things. You know, something like Bradley Beal, for instance, he's a very, very expensive player. The Wizards continue to, you know, be a bit mediocre. They might want to rebuild, you know, a lot like maybe the Utah Jazz last year when uh, they really did the rebuild. They traded two guys who were franchise players. Well, they actually traded more than that, but, you know, two very notable guys in Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert, and they're trying to do that rebuild. Someone like Paul George, I think think he's going to stay with the Clippers, obviously, but uh, he's somebody that might be, you know, within a window as well, and maybe the Clippers are not happy with where they're at right now. You know, they took a shot with getting Paul George, with getting Kawhi Leonard, and it just really hasn't panned out for him. Well, you can't can't be happy when you're above the a luxury tax and you get bounced in the first round like that Mm -hmm. like or you're paying Kawhi Leonard millions upon millions of dollars for this guy to what come in and play like 25 games like the the Clippers wouldn't have even made the the freaking playoffs if it wasn't for PG-13 um 
and you know like while none of these guys are officially on the table it couldn't hurt to make the call anyways and if mm -hmm. you're the utah jazz and you have the assets you have you know that you can outbid almost every other team if these guys become available or if you just call up these offices and you're like look man we'll offer you five first round draft picks for paul george yeah and you, you know, know Kevin Durant was traded, Kyrie Irving, so it's not mm -hmm. out of the realm of like possibility. And now I, I made a segment where I think that, you know, the Jazz, and this is speculation again, but uh, they might be able to trade for a franchise player. Maybe not somebody in a two to three window, two to three year window rather, but a guy who's young and up and coming. And granted, I threw Obi Toppin in there. I don't think he is even in the same realm as these other guys that we're talking about. Right. But, you know, he's somebody that I like and somebody that I could see a future with, you know, that he could turn into a franchise player potentially. Oh, oh yeah. Anytime Obi Toppin plays more than 20 minutes a game, the guy averages like 28 and 10 okay like he's a fantastic power forward and you know i think it's a travesty that he has to play behind julius randall um and i like julius randall but look that ap after what that guy said in the last post game conference well maybe miami just wants him more than us there is no way that new york doesn't part ways with him but Obi Toppin absolutely has that kind of potential. Like that kid, it's not its not a fluke. It really isn't. If you look at his statistics every single time, he plays more than 20 minutes a game and they put him in a starting role, he, he averages over like 28 points. He's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, looking at these guys, Trey Young, for instance, there's been rumors surrounding him. They asked him, you know about the rumors he said they might be true they might be not that's kind right. of weird to say and uh you know they took a shot on getting their new franchise coach in quinn snyder and uh maybe trey young's on the chopping block who knows someone like carl anthony towns i think the minnesota timberwolves are in a bit of a bind i'm sure they want their future to be with anthony edwards but yes. uh it seems a lot like carl anthony towns just sometimes doesn't have the drive there's been multiple instances like jimmy butler talking about how he doesn't have the drive carl anthony towns doesn't have the drive when they played together and uh even if you watch an interview a post-game interview with the point guard it wasn't anthony edwards it was uh michael mike conley he was talking a little bit about it. It's just like, you know, we can't really be playing video games. We really just need to focus on basketball. And this was in a post-game interview. Carl Anthony Towns hears it. He says something, you know, and so there might be a little bit of turmoil there and maybe the Timberwolves are going to want him out. I personally wouldn't want him with the Jazz. And uh, Doc, we continue to see a few things with Luka Doncic. Now the Bleacher Report, you know, very reputable mm -hmm. website as well as, you know, guys who go through the trades you know they go through rumors and stuff like that very reputable they're talking that utah jazz have their eye on luca yeah you know to all the haters out there who said it was just clickbait when we brought it up turns out it wasn't just clickbait now luca might not be available that doesn't mean that the teams like the jazz aren't watching same with Trey Young, same with Carl Anthony Towns, even though I wouldn't want him. I think getting Obi Toppin would be a steal because I love the potential that that kid has. Mm -hmm. I, man, I, I would love to have Obi Toppin. Um, and as, in terms of Trey Young too, I mean, Quinn Snyder just cleaned house on his entire coaching staff. I could absolutely see and we know how Quinn operates too as Jazz fans. He likes to have control and say over his roster. Um, I would not be surprised if John Collins, Trey Young, all of a sudden found themselves on the chopping block. I think really the only person who's safe on that team is DeJounte Murray. I think that he came out the gate and really started to perform a lot better um, when Quinn showed up. But we will have to see. So, yeah. hey guys. Thank you so much for listening. I don't know if you have anything else prepared, but we're kind of hitting our 50 minute mark. And uh, I have some things to do. I know you have some things to do, but guys, thank you so much for listening to the Full Court Press podcast. Please like, subscribe, let us know what you guys think. Yeah, thank you for tuning in and uh, hope to see you guys again soon.